So I'm kind of behind you on things, and um, I will be uh, right after class working to uh, start learning that system. But um, I, you know, I just can't make promises if it's going to be everything's going to be up by the end of this week or not. And uh, I need to go get some things checked out. So hopefully I'll, I'll speak clearly enough that I can help you uh, learn something that you might not know. But uh, so I'm a little bit behind on things and I apologize. Uh, we do have our first quiz on Thursday. It'll be a review quiz and it'll be at the beginning of, of class. So, um, and there's a lot of different ways I, I give quizzes. Sometimes it might be a quiz for the table. And you go, oh, geez, I need to sit with, you know, I can't sit with you anymore. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, sometimes it will be individuals, sometimes it will be, I give a brief quiz, and then you and your table mates will get together and work it out. And teaching each other is a big part of health profession school. So everybody kind of goes, well, I thought it was this because of this reason. And, and you know, you have five minutes to try to teach each other to, okay, this why this is why it's right, this is why it's wrong. A lot of different ways you give quizzes. And uh, so Thursday will be our first one, okay? Any questions before we roll here? Well, uh, we've been kind of working our way through the list and we're to the point where uh, we're gonna talk about getting things across the membrane. We've spent so much time talking about how this lipid bilayer is a barrier. It is a very powerfully selective barrier on what it allows to cross freely or not. So there are some things that are electrically neutral, that are lipophilic, hydrophobic, such as fatty acids, cholesterol, steroid hormones. They can just cross. This right here is the barrier. Remember, these heads aren't really to scale. They're much, much smaller. So those type of molecules can just pass across readily. Oxygen, CO2 can as well. But things that are polar or charged or ions, neurotransmitters, things that are, are, are polar, that have low lipid solubility, things that are large, they can't get across. But lots of times you need to get those molecules across to tell the interior of that cell what to do and when to do it. Or sometimes you just need the material out here to do some job on the inside. So since all these types of things over here can't cross, the body has to have strategies to either get those molecules across or at least get their information that those molecules are carrying across. And that's really, really where we're going with with this. So, yep, I'm sure time and time again in biology and physiology classes before, uh, you've talked about how you get things across membranes. Well, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again because there are a number of drugs, for example, that are used to impact these transport processes. Sometimes you want to slow down those processes. Sometimes you want to speed them up. And there's different medications that will help you help your patient's bodies do that. So we're going to talk about that again. Uh, well, let me kind of go back. So transport, port means to carry. Trans means across, so it's carrying across. Transport means you're helping a molecule get across the membrane. Okay? Now. There are passive transport processes. There are, there are active transport processes. And whenever you hear passive, passive transport, that means you don't need ATP energy to do it. We always need some form of energy, but it isn't necessarily ATP energy. So passive transport processes, no ATP is required. We're going to see that there's kind of two flavors of that. 
diffusion, and sometimes it's called simple diffusion. Simple diffusion and diffusion are the same thing. And there's also facilitated diffusion. Both of these, you don't need ATP. And we're going to see as we go along with passive processes, the molecules have to be moving down their concentration rate, the chemical concentration rate. Remember how we talked about how concentration, or excuse me, gradients drive physiologic processes. Well, if you have a lot of molecule A on this side of the membrane and much less on this side, and that membrane will allow that molecule A to pass, it's going to pass from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The chemical concentration gradient is the so-called energy uh, that's used for that movement. ATP is not. Active processes, you need a ATP. And an active process is you're moving a molecule from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So sometimes they call that movement uphill. And sometimes with passive processes, you can talk about movement downhill. So when you have to go against the chemical concentration gradient, moving a molecule where there's not much of it to where there's a lot of it, you have to do an active process. And active processes require ATP energy. And we can break that down a little bit, too. Uh, there's primary active transport, which you're going to see you use ATP, step one, right now. Secondary active transport, ATP is used in, being used someplace, but not in step one. It's used later, some step two. So, there's some other things that I want you to know right here. Uh, facilitated diffusion and primary and secondary active transport. These require some membrane carrier protein. They require a membrane carrier protein to help get that molecule across. Facilitated diffusion and the active transport process. So they're called, medi as a category, they're called mediated transport. There is some protein that is helping to move whatever this molecule is across. So you'll see that Facilitated diffusion, that's, that's a passive transport process. And primary active transport, that's an active process, but they're both mediated transport. And sometimes you hear this called carrier transport. And sometimes you'll hear this called membrane carrier protein mediated transport. They all mean the same thing. They all mean the same thing. You need a protein, a specific carrier transport protein in the membrane to help facilitate or mediate the movement of whatever this molecule is across the membrane. Sometimes it's from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That'd be facilitated diffusion. Sometimes it's an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. That would have to be an active transport process. Either primary, we use ATP right now, or secondary. You're going to use ATP, but not in step one. Not in step one. Now, just, we're going to talk about transport first, but just to let you know where we're going, is there's another way of getting mole, uh, molecules across the membrane, and it's by translocation, and I gave you a a general picture of that. This is when you have uh, channel proteins in the membrane. You have proteins that extend all the way through the membrane, and they have a channel that can be opened or closed. And translocation, what this is, is just locating across the membrane. If you open up a channel or a pore, channel and pore, P-O-R-E, they mean the same thing. That just opens up and allows the molecules to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. 
we're going to see there's a whole bunch of different type of translocation channel proteins. There's ones that will cause them to open or close. Sometimes it's something called ligands. Some channel proteins uh, open and close because of changes in voltage. A little electrical charge will cause them to open or close. Okay? And there's many, many, many. Some open because of temperature, some open because of pH, uh, some are affected uh, by uh, strain, mechanical perturbation. There's many, many, many different ones. Now, both transport translocation, this is getting molecules across the membrane. Remember that membrane is a barrier, so you have, the body has to have a whole number of different strategies to get molecules across the membrane to where they're needed. Sometimes you don't even get molecules across the membrane, you just need to get information across the membrane. And that's where signal transduction, or some type of messenger molecule outside of the cell will maybe bind a receptor on the membrane and then that receptor is activated, which then activates another process, another process, and it leads to some type of information being received by the interior of the cell. So that first messenger molecule that's in the interstitial fluid, it doesn't need to come across the membrane. It's just its message to us, just its information. So when we talk about Transport, translocation, molecules are moving, and with signal transduction, it's just information, okay? And as you might expect, huge amounts of medications. Some are involved with these translocation channel proteins, some are with transport proteins, dozens and dozens and dozens with signal transduction. So this is why we study these things. We need to understand what's normal. You'll then understand a little bit better what's abnormal. Then you'll learn how to therapeutically manipulate these processes and help your patients. So this is a picture from your book, figure 4-1. So put a little note in your book, 4-1. Uh, you know, I don't replicate in most cases the illustrations from your book. Uh, you can take a look at them. And you know, this is just reminding you something that you learned early in grade school about diffusion. If you have a high concentration of something in this compartment, that over time, just because of running motion, molecules will move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. That, it just happens, it happens. And you know that, and uh, it gets to the point where there's an equilibrium. And once there's an equilibrium, is movement continuing on? Yeah, there is movement. But they're kind of equal. What's going to the right is equal to what's going to the left. So uh, take a look at that figure one again, and or four dash one. Here's four dash three, and this is just kind of showing. Here we have a semi-permeable membrane, and we've got a lot of a certain, one type of molecule on this side, and very little on this side. So you're still you're going to have a net movement. This membrane is somewhat permeable, not completely permeable, but somewhat permeable, whatever this molecule is. You're going to have a lot more left to right movement than right to left movement, just by random motion of these molecules. So you're going to have much more of a left to right flux than a right to left flux. So there is a net flux. So what we're really going to be looking at in all these illustrations coming up is net flux. <coughs> just because you see a lot on one side and none on the other, don't just go, oh, it can only go in one direction. No, they, they can go in both directions. It's just that this top flux far exceeds the bottom flux. Okay? These are things you don't put before. Okay, so let's jump into diffusion. As I mentioned, uh, it's often called simple diffusion. And diffusion is a passive process, no ATP required. Now, diffusion is often just kind of, ah, oh, it's just diffusion. Hopefully, once we talk about this a little bit, <coughs> we'll go, 
Oh, it's diffusion. I mean, diffusion just blows me away. How elegant it is because of its simplicity. And it does some things for us that is almost beyond comprehension how well it does for us. So, I do, yeah, the book has a lot of nice diagrams, but it shows everything all at once. I, you're going to see this throughout the semester. I have a lot of very simple one kind of step drawings that, and it's because I'm kind of simple minded. This is how I draw simple diffusion, okay? And so here we have a membrane that is somewhat permeable to this molecule. And up above, the driving force for diffusion is the chemical concentration gradient. Boy, oh boy, just kind of know that and live by it. So we have a lot more of whatever this molecule is, but we know it can cross that membrane. So there's some things, some predictions we can make on this. You know, if there's no membrane proteins there, I would go, well, it's probably hydrophobic lipophilic, right? If I drew, drew this and you don't see membrane proteins on that, I'd say, tell me the physiochemical characteristics of this molecule. You should be able to tell me, uh, which I'm sure you can. So you know that the movement would be from the left compartment to the right compartment. That would be the net flux. And being the artist I am trying to represent things, I have that arrow going down, meaning it's downhill movement, meaning it's going from high concentration to low concentration. Now there is an equation, and it's a little more clear on the next slide, that regulates how fast a molecule goes across. Now there is a membrane permeability concept that I left out. Uh, just to simplify, because you don't need to worry too much about it, but what this is, is SA, you're gonna see on the next slide, that's surface area times something called diffusivity for the molecule times the concentration on the inside minus the concentration on the outside. All of that, that product together divided by T, that's the thickness of the barrier for the diffusion. And this is called fixed law of diffusion and uh, F-I-C-K is the guy's name. Fixed law of diffusion. We'll see the Fick principle later on in the cardiovascular. So here we just have movement going from uh, high concentration to low concentration, no ATP required. But you always need some energy, and what's the energy driving this? The chemical concentration gradient. Chemical concentration gradient, right? So let's take a look at this next slide. So fixed law of diffusion. Uh, diffusion rate is, a, okay, SA is surface area. This diffusivity, this really has a couple of components. It's lipid solubility divided by the molecular weight of the substance. So you would know that the more lipid soluble something is, the easier it would be for it to get across that membrane, because that membrane is a lipid, it's a bilipid layer. layer. And then that C in, C out, that's the concentration gradient, all over T, the thickness of the barrier for diffusion. Now, down here, now, the courses you're going to be taking, I'm not going to give you some number and, and uh, say, okay, calculate the number for diffusion. No, no, no. It's all relative. It's all relative. I want I'll be asking you, okay, this disease process does this. How does it impact that equation? So what you really need to get very comfortable with is the idea of direct, directly related and inversely related. And sometimes it's also called indirectly related. But which of the factors above are directly related to diffusion? So what does directly related mean? Directly related mean when the factor goes up, diffusion goes up. When the factor goes down, diffusion rate goes down. That's what directly related means. Inversely means if the factor goes up, what's going to happen to diffusion? It goes down. That's right. And if the factor goes down, what happens to diffusion? 
it goes up. So take a look at this, and you have to be, tell me the first one that you can see very easily is inversely related. Thickness, yeah. Is there another one that's inversely related? Molecular weight. But this is the square root of molecular weight, so once you square, do the square root, it kind of decreases it. But the greater the thickness for the barrier diffusion, the greater the molecular weight, the less the diffusion rate. Okay? So let's kind of uh, look at a couple of things like this. Now, there's some. There's, I, I, you know, there are a little bit subtleties, and you only need to see them once, and then you go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So here I have the normal situation that I illustrated before. So if the amount of this molecule on this left compartment goes up, what's going to happen to the diffusion rate? It'll go up. I agree. I agree. Because what has changed in this re in this equation? The chemical concentration rate. Good, good, good. Now, you go, okay, that's really simple. That's really simple. What's the other way that you can increase the chemical concentration rate? Increase the amount of particles in the hydrogen. There we go. So, yes, yeah, so just what you said, and we'll get to that. So yes, diffusion rate would go up. Diffusion rate would go up if this situation occurs. So let's go back to normal. Here's an equally, and actually the more common way that concentration gradients are changed in the body is, whoa, all of a sudden there's much left, less in this compartment. This is the very same thing. You just increase the chemical concentration gradient, so the diffusion rate goes up. So I want you to understand that you can increase the chemical concentration gradient by increasing in this compartment, or you can increase the chemical concentration gradient by decreasing in this compartment. Either works, right? It's the difference in concentration gradient that's important. Not where. Not where. And actually, this is more common. What's going on here? Does this occur loading this up? Yeah, but this is more common. And I'll show you some examples of that coming up. So, so let's think. Here we have a nice little cell. It's just minding its own business. And these circles around it, those are oxygen molecules. And you can see there's a lot more oxygen outside of the cell. There's a lot more circles than inside of the cell. It's more concentrated on the outside than on the inside. So, you tell me, are we going to have a net diffusion of oxygen into the cell or the diffusion of oxygen out of the cell? It's going to be going in, yeah. So we're going to have oxygen influx. It's going to be going in influx, right? And that's that's exactly what, what we have. So oxygen is going to flow into that cell. And uh, then that cell can use that oxygen. Why do cells use oxygen? How do, How is the vast majority of oxygen utilized? It's the, it's for making ATP, it's the very last step of the electron transport chain. We need oxygen as the electron acceptor and basically the more oxygen a cell consumes, the more ATP it's producing. So we need oxygen for the aerobic metabolism and production of ATP. So here's a cell, you know, it has quite a bit of intracellular fluid oxygen, so I'm going to say that's not a very metabolically active cell because it still has quite a bit of oxygen around. It'll consume oxygen if it's metabolically busy. So, what happens to intracellular, gee whiz, I just gave you, the, I forgot I put this here. So what happens to intracellular oxygen content when a cell becomes metabolically active? What's going to happen to the amount of it? It's going to go down. Now I've really magnified, I show 
three molecules of oxygen inside this cell. Let's say you have a cell that you only see one. Actually, that, that's a radical shift, and it's just usually just small shifts, but I wanted to illustrate this. You see that what's out here in the extracellular fluid, it's the same, right? But you now have a cell that's very metabolically active. It's consuming oxygen, consuming oxygen. What has happened to the concentration gradient? It's increased a lot. So what's going to happen to diffusion? It'll increase a lot, right? So that's what happens. Now there's, you know, some subtle ele elegance here. You don't need a sensor on this cell. You don't need a, a neuron. You don't need any regulatory mechanisms to have more oxygen come in. That cell's using more oxygen, so the gradient becomes bigger, so more oxygen goes there. It's simple. Metabolically active cells have more oxygen come into them. So, let's take a look at two neighboring cells. One cell, we see four oxygen molecules in here. One's this cell over here to the right, one oxygen molecule. Which cell would have the greatest oxygen diffusion into it? Yeah, the one on the right. You're exactly correct. So, the bottom line, and this is the beauty of simple diffusion. And I'm just going to use the case of oxygen here. The more oxygen that cell needs, the more it's going to get. So you can have two neighboring cells. One is very active and one isn't nearly as active. And this happens throughout the body. And guess what? Because of simple diffusion that people often go, oh, it's just simple diffusion. That cell that needs more gets more. It's beautifully balanced. It's beautifully balanced. And you don't need any powerful regulatory mechanisms to do that. It's simple concentration. And this helps maintain function throughout the body in many, many different ways. Those cells that need more, get more. Those cells that need less, get less. Have you ever thought of diffusion that way? It's wonderfully elegant in how it, you know, regulates demand and supply. Any questions on that? Okay, so you have the one on the right that will have greater oxygen diffusion. So, uh, so what happens to diffusion rate if the concentration on the left increases and increases and increases? So, if, if it increases, you'll have more diffusion. If it increases more, you'll have more. If it increases more, you'll have even more. Now, here's a... I meant to put this later on in your notes, and I didn't, but do make a note for yourself, please. Uh, I want you, and you might even want to sketch this out uh, in your notes, that in figure 4-9, so down here on the bottom, you can think of this as uh, really the chemical concentration gradient. The way your book sets it up, it just says, okay, uh, intracellular whatever is stays the same, but the extracellular concentration is increasing. I want you to think of this really as a chemical concentration gradient increasing. And what this is telling you is that, and this is, whoops, the flux of whatever this molecule is that's diffusing in into the cell. Notice that with simple diffusion, there is a direct linear relationship, a direct linear relationship between chemical concentration gradient and the diffusion rate. The greater the gradient going from left to right, the greater the diffusion rate. You see that's a nice straight line. So simple diffusion has this type of kinetics, a nice straight line. 
So if you were to just draw a simple diagram, put concentration gradient, it's increasing from left to right. And this is diffusion rate going from low to high, and it's a nice straight line. Now the slope of that line depends on a permeability factor of the membrane. We're not going to worry about that constant. Different tissues have different constants. But diffusion, the greater, you know, the driving force for simple diffusion is concentration gradient. So the greater the concentration gradient, the greater the diffusion rate. It's a direct linear relationship between concentration gradient and diffusion rate. Thank you. And we're going to see that for any of the mediated transport processes, that's not the case. It's direct, 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 and then it flattens out. So whether we're talking facilitated diffusion, primary active transport, or secondary active transport, we're going to see a totally different type of line. It's not going to be that direct linear relationship. It's curved linear. So let's kind of put simple diffusion. Let's think about it a little bit. Uh, normally, you know, when you so here we have a small airway coming down into an alveolar sac, so there's four little alveoli, and you might not know it, but each alveolus on average has about 1,000 pulmonary capillaries. They're incredibly vascular, incredibly vascular. And this is supposed to be a pulmonary capillary, so CO2 is leaving this pulmonary capillary and oxygen is coming in from the lung into the blood of the pulmonary capillary. So you're uh, delivering and uh, exhaling out CO2. You're inhaling and delivering to the bloodstream oxygen. Okay, And that's why, remember, CO2 and oxygen, they're freely diffusible. So this is by simple diffusion. There are some things. now. This is how I'm going to be showing you emphysema. And I'll be drawing in a little bit more. But with emphysema, you have this breakdown of the septal walls. You have a loss of a certain type of connecting, connective tissue component. What's actually going on, and you might not notice that, is with emphysema, you have a decrease in the effective surface area for diffusion. So as emphysema progresses, what happens to a person's ability to diffuse gases? It goes down. As surface area goes down, the ability to diffuse that CO2 and oxygen goes down. So do some people with emphysema, as they become more and more uh, progressed in their disease, do they have diffusion difficulties? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to see all sorts of things feed into this. Now there's another, here's just another example of a pulmonary condition. Interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. With interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, you have this uh, elaboration, this inappropriate elaboration of scar tissue on the small airways and those alveolar sacs. You get thick scar tissue. So if that, the thickness of that tissue increases and increases, guess what? The T, the thickness for the barrier diffusion goes up. So somebody with interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, do you think their diffusion gets better or gets worse? It gets worse. That's absolutely right. So this simple equation can tell you a lot of things that go on pathophysiologically in patients. Um, so, exercise. How does exercise, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in cardiovascular, but like I mentioned, you have about a thousand pulmonary capillaries in each alveolus, and when you exercise, what happens to your heart rate? It goes up. 
what happens to you is the stroke volume, the amount of blood being ejected with every beat, goes up. So the amount of cardiac output from your right heart goes up. So more and more blood's being passed in these pulmonary capillaries. Guess what? That pops open some capillaries that hadn't been open. It causes the ones that were open to open even wider. So when you are exercising, what do you think happens to this? If you have more and more capillaries and they're opening more and more widely, passively, uh, what do you think happens to the surface area for diffusion? It goes up. I love, you know, people go, People don't want to say it out loud, but people don't. It's going up. That's right. And if you were to build this machine, isn't this what you want it to do? As you're exercising, your peripheral body needs more and more oxygen, and even more importantly, it needs to get rid of more and more CO2. And so wouldn't you want that diffusion of gases at your lungs to improve as that demand goes up? Yep. That's built to the system. So the diffusion of gases increases when you exercise. Uh, uh, emphysema, you have a breakdown of surface area. Pulmonary edema, pulmonary edema, you have the accumulation of fluid. And I really, uh, I have another illustration. These capillaries are actually embedded in the walls. But you can actually have an accumulation of fluid that separates this airspace from the capillary. So as fluid accumulates, what ha what's happening? You're increasing the thickness of the barrier for diffusion. So pulmonary edema, you have this uh, accumulation of fluid in the lungs, and what does that do? It increases the thickness of the barrier for diffusion, it decreases diffusion capacity. Alveolar uh, fibrosis already talked about that. Supplemental oxygen, you, you'll you see, and I know you've already seen a lot of people with supplemental oxygen. What are you trying to change in this equation by using supplemental oxygen? Yep, the chemical concentration gradient. You're not doing anything to these, these. So that simple equation, you know, like I've mentioned before, really, really understand the elements, all the elements of all the equations. So many parts of this equation are impacted by different pathological conditions, and therefore, you will try to manage them differently. Okay, so let's talk about facilitated diffusion, or it can be called carrier uh, facilitated diffusion. So diffusion, when you see diffusion, you know a molecule is going from high concentration to low concentration. And that's what I'm trying to do. Excuse me. Whoa, let's go back, let's go back. That's what I'm trying to depict right here. You got a lot on this side, much less on this side. But we have a protein here. We have a transport protein here. If we have a chemical concentration gradient, why would we need a transport protein? Yeah, that's one of those molecules that cannot freely cross the membrane. It's probably hydrophilic lipophobic. The cell wants it to get across, but because of the physical chemistry characteristics of that molecule, it can't freely cross. So your body has devised ways, different transport proteins, to help bring those necessary molecules across the membrane. And so, this is the way your, your book describes it. And I, I, uh, the way I describe it, the way the book describes it, bottom line, both are wrong. That's not exactly physically how it works, but you can't represent on a two-dimensional piece of paper or on a slide how it actually works. The way the book shows, and, and it's perfectly fine, I don't care what you go with, they're showing that, okay, Sorry about that. There is this channel protein that the transported uh, molecule, the solute, it's going to bind certain areas. And once it binds enough of these areas, then this protein will change in its configuration and allow this to come through. 
I don't really like this too much. Number one, it's wrong, but what I'm going to show you is wrong too. Uh, this looks too much like a, a channel protein. Uh, your book, I love your book, but in this one, I kind of myself kind of go this way. Um, so here we have a membrane, and here is a transport protein. This transport protein is pretty picky on which what kind of molecules it'll pick up and bring across. For example, this might be a monosaccharide carrier protein. It might carry glucose and fructose across. But for example, it wouldn't carry across any of the amino acids. So it's selective. It's selective with what it'll bring across. And we're going to see all these mediated transport processes. They have certain correct, uh, characteristics. And one thing is selectivity. So here we have a protein. It is in the membrane, but it's selective in what it'll bring across. And we can see there's a high concentration of whatever this molecule is. Let's say it's glucose and a lower concentration right here. Well, glucose can just be banging around over here in this part of uh, this compartment to the left. And if it engages the carrying site on that transport protein, it binds there. And what does that do? The chemical concentration gradient, chemical concentration gradient is really a, it's a form of energy. It will help stimulate the movement of that. It's really an E version of that protein carrying that molecule across. In this case, it's in glucose. So it's just bopping around. It bumps into that glucose carrier. And once it engages, it just flips around and it releases it over here where there's much less glucose and then it reverts back to its original state. So the bottom line is it's a conformational change of whatever is being transported engages the transport protein. There's a change in conformation or the shape of the protein. While it's engaged, it brings it across the membrane and then it, once it no longer has anything on its carrier site, it reverts back to its original shape. So. What I'm kind of showing here is, you know, it's just bringing it across, bringing it across, bringing it across, this kind of thing, right? And it's just going to keep doing it as long as there's a concentration gradient. Now, this is where I said this, these carriers, they're all selective. While there might be some wiggle room, a glucose carrier might also carry another mono, closely related monosaccharide like fructose across it, when they carry across a basic amino acid. And a basic amino acid carrier would not carry across an acidic amino acid. So do we have dozens and dozens and dozens of these carrier proteins on the membranes of select cells, and they're very specific on what they bring across. So that's selectivity. Okay? They just don't carry everything. Now, what I want you to think about is, so let's say we have a membrane, and it has X number of proteins in it. And each protein can just work so fast. So let's say here's the concentration gradient, here's the transport rate. As we have more and more, if we would have more and more on this side, there'd be a greater likelihood for, if the more you have on this side, the greater likelihood that one of these molecules, these transported molecules, is going to bump into that carrier site just right. Because these are just all kind of milling about, and they need to bump into that specific site just right, and then that transport protein brings it across. And does it just, in your gut, make sense? The more we have over here, the more chance one is going to bump into that and more is going to come across. And that's what's going to happen. As the concentration gradient increases, the amount that's going to be coming across every minute is going to increase. But, and okay, so we have even more over here. More is going to be coming across every minute. But, there will be a point that even if we have much more on this side. The transport rate is going to max out. And why is that? 
you only have X number of carriers and they can only work so fast. And once every single carrier is working absolutely as fast as it can, that's the best it can do. So your transport uh, rate maxes out. So this is said to be, uh, this shows what's called saturation kinetics. Saturation kinetics, it means that you can saturate these carrier proteins and they can only do as good as they can, 100% and no more. When every one of those proteins is engaged and carrying and it's transporting as fast as it can, it doesn't matter if the concentration gradient keeps going up, 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 up. They can only work so fast. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So that's saturation. You saturate it to carriers, they can't go any faster. There's another term on here, T max, transportation max. There is a transportation maximum in which molecules can come across membranes. And, and saturation and T max occur at the same time. At this point, when all your carriers are saturated, that's your transportation max. So saturation and Tmax are extremely closely related to one another. So, this is what you would see with facilitated diffusion. With simple diffusion, it's a straight line. As long as you have an increasing concentration gradient, more is going to be transported. But with facilitated diffusion, it maxes out. This is the exact type of kinetics you're going to see with the active transport processes too. Because once again, anytime you have a membrane, anytime you have a membrane carrier protein, whether it's facilitated diffusion or any of the active transport processes, you're going to see selectivity, you're going to see saturation, you're going to see a Tmax. Because membrane proteins can only work so fast. And they can't give you any more. Any questions on that? So this is that illustrated illustration once in the book, once again from the book. That this line, if you copy this uh, down a little bit, this is the type of line you'll see with, with facilitated diffusion. This is what you're going to see with primary active transport. This is what you're going to see with secondary active transport. Anytime you need a membrane carrier protein, you'll see saturation and Tmax kinetics, and also selectivity. Um, I'm wondering, doesn't diffusion at some point slow down on that curve almost? Because almost the same principle we classify. If you keep going back in the time, you know, so at some point, we break and allow all the same amount of assuming completed for that movement, at some point, it slows down the rate of Now, are you talking with facilitated? Simple diffusion. Or with simple? Yeah. With simple, with simple, as long as you maintain the concentration rate. Now, I can see where you're saying, okay, if more and more comes in, you're going to lose the concentration rate, right? Because as more and more comes in, you're going to lose the concentration rate and that will go down. But if you are going into an infinite compartment, oh, okay. and, and that's really how you have to visualize it, you never, you never will actually, and actually in your body, we're never in that situation. So a simple diffusion, just think that line is linear. Uh, on a lab bench, could I max that out and make it come over? You bet I can. In your body, we're built right. We're built right. Okay? And that's linear. Exactly. Okay, so here's the where those sites are uh, saturated, and here would be T max in that illustration. So there's another principle called competition. So anytime you have membrane carrier proteins, you have Selectivity, those carrier proteins are selective with what they'll bring across. You have saturation kinetics, 
you have a transportation maximum or T max. You also can see competition. And this, this, this is actually a lot simpler than what these diagrams would look like. Okay, so let's say there is a carrier. Well, there's actually a family of carriers in your body that they primarily are glucose carriers across the membrane, but they also do have some affinity for fructose as well. So what this is, is okay, if you would just put glucose into the system, you can see you can put more and more and more glucose into the left compartment, you'll get more and more transport before it saturates out. But if you put the closely related molecule fructose into the system as well, guess what? You can't carry as much glucose across because some of those carriers are going to be busy carrying fructose. So imagine, you've probably all seen a picture of, you know, a line of people, you know, uh, transferring sandbags, you know, uh, live down in New Orleans you know, during hurricane season and, you know, helping sandbag and so forth. You have a line of people, and let's say there's white sandbags and there's red sandbags. And if you're just hauling white sandbags, you can maybe move, you know, 10 sandbags through here every minute. Because that's all you're carrying. But if somebody starts also picking up the red sandbags, you're going to be moving less white sandbags per minute because the red sandbags are also part of the system now. That's competition. That's competition. That's all that means. When you happen to have a selective carrier that will allow more than one molecule to come across, it just means any one of the molecules, its T max and its saturation point is going to be lower. Why? Because the other related molecule is going to be occupying those transporters somewhat. So the thing to note is look through this and just note with competition, and this becomes important with certain medications and how they affect transporters. Uh, with competition, you'll see changes in T max and uh, the transportation max due to competition. So this looks like a scary, scary thing. But once you look at that, you go, oh, well, yeah. And you know, just make compound A glucose and compound B fructose. You go, oh, yeah, if the carrier's partially occupied with fructose, it won't be able to carry as much glucose every minute. And then it becomes very, very simple. So selectivity, saturation kinetics, T maximums, and competition. Anytime you have membrane proteins helping you, membrane transport proteins helping you, you'll see those four things, okay? And sometimes that becomes very important. Okay, let's think about the special, and I know this has turned out very dark in your notes, and I'm sorry about that. The, the case of water, the case of water and osmosis. And so <clears throat> osmosis is simply water diffusion. And once again, Molecules diffuse from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So, let's look here in the left compartment. The open circles are water molecules. The closed circles in this solution are solute molecules. And then you look over here, you can see there's a lot more solute molecules, a lot less water molecules. So osmosis is simply so, and you often don't think of it this way, but this, in compartment A, you have a higher water concentration than compartment B. Higher water concentration, lower water concentration, right? So osmosis, in its simplest form, is simply diffusion from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water. Does that make sense? And oftentimes we make it a lot more difficult, but that's really all it is, okay? So, now we've kind of gone through uh, passive uh, transport processes. 
let's look at the active transport processes where, and once again, all the things with selectivity, Tmax, saturation kinetics, and competition, they hold true for the active transport processes because these also require a membrane carrier protein. So active transport processes, you're moving a molecule from low concentration to high concentration, and um, it needs ATP. Active needs ATP. So here's the way I draw a simple active transport process. A, a molecule is moving from an area of low concentration to an area of higher concentration. It's going to require a membrane transport protein, and you can call that uphill movement, uphill movement, okay? So let's kind of separate these into primary and secondary active transport. So active transport, it needs ATP. It's going from an area of low concentration to high concentration. Here are two examples of primary active transport processes. Here we have a calcium ATPase transport protein, or pump, that we have much less calcium concentration inside the cell. It's much higher outside of this cell. And there is a transport protein that utilizing the energy of taking ATP, hydrolyzing it down to ADP, and that phosphoryl subunit, that liberates energy that liberated energy will supply the energy necessary to pump that calcium out. And here we have a phagolysosome. Let's say you're, you have a neutrophil that's involved some invading bacteria, and it's going to acidify that phagolysosome to start a process of degrading that invading bacteria. And here we're going to pump protons. This is a proton pump. And this is an example of, with a primary active transport, ATP is being used, boom, right away, step one. So we're using ATP to pump protons against the concentration gradient into this phagolysosome, this organelle. We have many, many, many different types of these primary active transporters. One of the most common is this one. This is the sodium potassium ATPase exchange pump. And remember what I told you outside of the cell? What's the extracellular concentration for sodium that I told you not to remember? 150. What's inside for sodium? 15. How about potassium outside? 4. Potassium inside? 140. So when you have potassium and sodium moving across that membrane because of action potentials, degraded potentials, what have you, you need to get them back to where they belong. So what this does is this is pumping sodium back out into the extracellular fluid where it belongs and potassium back into the cell where it belongs at the same time. And it works out that three sodiums come out, two potassiums go in when you utilize the energy of ATP. Now, I think every living vital cell in your body has this sodium potassium ATPase exchange pump working 24 7, 365 to maintain these sodium potassium chemical concentration gradients. I need to be careful because in the inner ear and there's some others, you have a different type of exchange pump. So, most, most cells in your body have this going on all the time. Not all. But it's using ATP in step one, isn't it? It's using ATP right away to get the job done. And this is how your book is showing it. And you know, I, I don't have a problem with it. But this is the sodium potassium ATP exchange pump. And oh, I didn't grab what figure this is. So you know, take a look. Which one? 411. 411, thank you very much. Thank you. So look at 411 to see how your book illustrates it. Because one of these will work for you and the other one won't. And it's still gonna, it's still gonna be fine. You know, whatever works for you, so you remember it. Now let's move to secondary active transport. Secondary active transport. 
Active transport. That means the molecule that you're really interested in is going to be going a, against a chemical concentration rate. Okay? It's secondary active transport, so you know that ATP is not going to be used on step one. It's going to be used, so you're going to use ATP some other time, but not on step one. It's going to be step two or whenever. There's a couple of different types of uh, secondary active transport. We're going to see there's uh, co-transport and there's counter-transport. This first one I'm going to show you is co-transport. When you see co, it means at least two, and sometimes it's more than two, but at least two things are being transported together. And when you see co-transport, they're being transported in the same direction. So co-transport, at least two molecules are being transported, and they're being transported in the same direction. We're going to see that counter-transport, one is going one way and the other one's going the other way. So this is, this is the situation here. This is the sodium glucose co-transport, and we have a whole family of these sodium glucose co-transporters. And the other name for this is symport. Now transport, once again, port means to carry, trans means across. Sim means that they're going in the similar direction. Similar direction. Uh, so sim means same. So it's the same carry, carry direction. So the way this works, the way this works is Glucose is really what's being actively transported. And we have a lot more glucose inside of most cells than outside of the cells. So here we have a membrane protein, a membrane carrier protein that has a docking site for glucose. So glucose can bind to that docking site, but it's stuck there. I want you to visualize me, a little old man I'm going through a revolving door. <laughs> and here you are, a young person, you're going along going, ah, that old guy, he used to be a professor, poor guy. And you're coming along the same way, and you push the door, and you, well, thank you very much. You push me in. That's the way I kind of envision this. Thing. You know, we're both going the same direction, and you just gave me a ride. <laughs> you just gave me a right. That's what happens. Remember, you have a tenfold chemical concentration gradient for sodium. So sodium also has a binding site. It's moving down that tenfold chemical concentration gradient. So sodium moving down its chemical concentration gradient is going to spin that transport protein and glucose is going to pop in with it. That's the way I think. You helping somebody going in the same direction through a revolving door. Is that actually the case confirmationally? No, but you know, if you can visualize that, you've got it. You've got it forever. So this will go on and go on and go on, but if it just keeps going on, the amount of sodium inside the cell is going to increase, won't it? And what is actually powering this sodium glucose co-transport process? the chemical concentration for sodium. So if sodium increases in here, this is going to stop. So right over here, there's that sodium potassium ATPH exchange bump, excuse me, that what is it going to do? It's going to keep sodium low inside the cell because it's going to continually pump it out. Don't worry about, oh, now potassium is going to accumulate. We have another way of dealing with it. Guess what? That uses ATP. So glucose is going against the concentration gradient. That means it's an active transport process. It's a secondary active transport process because you're not using ATP right here, are you? You're using the energy of the chemical concentration gradient for sodium. But you are using ATP someplace else. So do you kind of see some main differences between primary and secondary active transport? when ATP is being utilized. Okay, so uh, I'll wait until you 
finish writing because I'm going to show you, you know, I'm nuts about making very, very simple illustrations of things. So, here we have this chemical concentration gradient for sodium, at least five times more outside than inside. The glucose concentration gradient, a lot more on the inside. So, we're going to have glucose engage that and then sodium going down its chemical concentration gradient going to bring both across. Just like pushing somebody through a revolving door. Okay? So does that kind of make sense to you? You're not using ATP here, you're using the chemical concentration gradient. Will you use ATP to keep sodium low? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, so a little clinical correlation uh, because I know you're going, man, I've learned about these things all my life, these transport processes. Well, yeah, you're going to keep learning about them. So these uh, sodium-dependent glucose transporters, there are a family of them. I'm only showing uh, SGLT1 and SGLT2 right here. But in your small intestine, in your enterocytes, you have this glucose transporter to take glucose from the gluten or excuse me, from your gut, put it into the bloodstream. But in your renal proximal tubule, you have both of these. And there have been a lot of advertisements for different drugs to help diabetics. And these uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are, uh, they've been around now for, boy, I can't remember now. Is it like seven years, six, seven years that the first one was, was approved? And uh, here's the two that are most commonly prescribed in this country. And really, what do they do? Is they imagine if this is, your kidney is set up to filter a lot of things. And your kidney wants to take the filtrate from the blood and rather than releasing good things in the urine, return the good things back into the bloodstream. Well, glucose is one of the good things. But an uncontrolled diabetic has too much. So what these inhibitors do is it will inhibit the function of this co-transport protein, and it decreases the amount of, gluc of filtered glucose that's reclaimed from the renal filtrate that normally would be put back into the blood. It would just remain. It would then become urine, and then you would release it in the urine. So you're getting rid of some of that excess plasma glucose by renal excretion, OK? By inhibiting that sodium glucose for transport. Yes? So when it's acting as an inhibitor, is it just binding where glucose typically would? Uh, yeah, good off? question. How does that inhibitor work? It, it's not competing for those binding sites. It's changing the conformation and function of the protein in a different way. So can sodium so, still process at that point, or does it stop the sodium as well? Well, okay, there are dozens of ways for sodium to be reabsorbed. So in this case, both sodium and glucose the efficiency of their reabsorption by that process goes down dramatically. But you're going to see that there's dozens of ways to get the sodium. So don't think, oh, at the expense of glucose, we're now going to be releasing a bunch of stuff. We have physiologic regulation of reclaiming our, we can reclaim our sodium all the way to the end of the nephron. Glucose, it's just the very first section is the only place where we have these. Good question. Yeah. So the, these are in the um, small intestine and in the renal area. So that like some of it goes straight through the body, like the, the small intestine, and some of it's in the bloodstream already, and it's just not. Well, well, this that I was talking about in the small intestine is the food you eat. Gotcha. You know, you need to get that digested carbohydrate that's now individual monosaccharides, you need to pick up those glucose molecules and get it from your gut into the bloodstream. This is one of the ways. The, the number one, uh, that is one of the ways of getting that glucose from your gut into the bloodstream. Uh, now, the important thing 
it's the inhib inhibition of this number two transporter, that's the only one that's in the kidney. So when you take these drugs, it's not changing the uh, uptake of glucose from the gut into the bloodstream. That's a different, that's the number one carrier. So there is no cross reactivity there. Okay, so that, okay, this Jardians, this was the first anti diabetic drug to show strong efficacy in reducing cardiovascular events and cardiovascular mortality. There have been, a, for years and years and years, um, people with poorly controlled diabetes have a much increased incidence of cardiovascular problems and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Uh, and you can help those patients control their plasma glucose, but a lot, even though you're controlling their plasma glucose, not all anti-diabetic drugs for years and years and years will halt the rapid progression of cardiovascular disease. That's a terrible thing, you know. You're helping with one part of the diabetic problem, but you're not helping to slow down the rapid progression of heart disease in certain individuals. Not all individuals with diabetes have rapid progression of cardiovascular disease. But this, and now there's another <coughs> class of drug in just the last 18 months have been shown to also have a fairly significant effect in reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And this, people who work in this for a living, they're going, this is potentially a game changer? Cross fingers, cross fingers. But the other thing that they're worried about is there have been so many other medications in other areas that they're really, really good at this, but then there's another problem later on that you don't know unless somebody's been on it, on the drug for four or five, six years. So quite truthfully, you know, a lot of people are still kind of worried for the other boots drop because this is almost looking too good to be true. Uh, so just uh, not too long ago, in January of, of this year, uh, the company that was made Jardians asked the FDA for permission to put in their instructions that not only does this help control hyperglycemia, it's also decreasing the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. Now, um, so people start going, uh-oh, people that have been on the drug longer, there look to be a slight increase in total amputations. And it's like, oh, is this that second boot dropping? And so now, now uh, they're following this even more. And this EMA, that's not our FDA, that's the European Medicines Agency. They were the first to find this. So everybody's kind of concerned that what they were hoping would be a landmark drug in helping to help both the glycemic aspect and the cardiovascular aspect of uh, diabetes, that it's not causing some other problem. So actually, you know, and so these studies are in this charting uh, of cases was ongoing. So hopefully, hopefully that was just a statistical clue. Glucose is not the only thing that come acro comes across with sodium. There are dozens of other things. So I'm just leaving this as X. Water-soluble vitamins come across this way. Many of the amino acids come across with sodium co-transport, sodium co-transport. So many different co-transport proteins are utilized to bring across many different things. Once again, they'd be very selective. So this co-transporter might be uh, for Alanine, but uh, glutamate can't come across with it. So there's many of these. So sodium is just an absolute workhorse in helping to co-transport molecules across that membrane. So let's kind of switch now to uh, the other secondary active transport, countertransport, and 
The other word for county counter transport is anti port. Anti port. Counter transport, anti port mean the same thing. Sometimes you see exchanger. So here we have a sodium calcium counter transport process. And so calcium has to go against its concentration gradient. There's a lot of ways of moving calcium. This is just one. But sodium going down its chemical concentration gradient helps to pop that calcium out. So the way I envision this is the little old guy, me, I get stuck in the revolving door, but you coming from the opposite direction, wearing NA plus on your jacket, you help pop me across to the opposite side. Once again, in this step one, you're not using ATP, you're using the chemical concentration gradient for sodium. But we need that sodium ATPase exchange pump to keep sodium low in here. That's the key, keeping the concentration gradient, and this will keep working. Now, here's another one, a sodium proton pump. Very same type of thing. Protons need to get out of the cell. This is happening big time in your kidneys as you sit here. But protons can't come out against your concentration gradient. They can't cross the membrane for one thing, but they can't get across because of the concentration gradient. Sodium will help power that across. And this is the way your book shows this, so I do want you to always take a look at the illustrations of the book. And to take a look how your book shows simple diffusion, this means there's a membrane protein that's going from high to low, that'd be facilitated diffusion. This membrane protein that's going from low to high, that would be an active transport process. This is a very, this table 4-2, very, very important that you look at it and study it until it just makes sense. And I would suggest that in that through, through a protein channel, you remember to, in your book, to write translocation channel, because we're going to be calling those translocation channel proteins. And this is another way. This, this takes some time to look at this and go, oh, OK, OK. So the red line is what's being actively transported, and the uh, black is what's being going from high to low. But this kind of shows different ways of getting across that membrane. Now, there are, what we'll be talking about beginning next time is not just getting, we're not going to be using uh, carrier proteins here. We're going to be using channel proteins to get ions and actually some other molecules across. That's what we'll talk about beginning next time, the translocation channel. See you then. Can I have a question about the SGL2 inhibitor? Mm -hmm. So it's inhibiting 